Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at Market Square Presbyterian Church uh, and our celebration of Earth Sunday. My um, name is Reverend Allison Smith and along with Reverend Kim Wadlington, our liturgist Morgan Dame, members of the Ecology Action Committee, our Minister of Music Tyler Canonico and members of the Sanctuary Choir will be leading you in worship this morning. Uh, a special welcome extended to you if you're a visitor with us today. We'd love to hear more from you, and uh, if you can fill out one of those yellow cards that are in the pew, we can uh, get in touch and learn more uh, about what you may need as you come to visit with us. A couple of announcements to bring to your attention before we begin. Uh, immediately following the worship service today, we'll have a congregational meeting which is called for the purpose of electing five at-large members from the congregation to serve on the nominating committee that elects church officers, that nominates church officers. Um, so please stick around after the worship service to participate in that meeting. In a moment, I'm going to invite Judy Shepler forward to, from the Peacemaking Committee to share more information about next week's opportunity during Adult Forum. But before I do that, I'd like to wish a very happy birthday to Jean Peters, who is turning 99 today. <laughs> happy birthday, Jean. Would you all join me in singing to her? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Thank you, Judy. Good morning. By now, you have, may have read the information in the marketplace about the upcoming racial wealth gap simulation. And you may even have had time this morning to read the blurb in the bulletin. So why am I here in person to bring it to your attention one more time in this moment for mission. Imagine for a moment a world without hunger, without poverty, a world in which people of all races receive fair treatment that results in equitable opportunities and outcomes for everyone. The racial wealth gap simulation was created by Bread for the World. For those of you who may not be familiar, Bread for the World is a nonpartisan Christian advocacy organization that is urging U.S. decision makers to do all they can to pursue a world without hunger. Their mission is to educate and equip people to advocate for policies and programs that can help end hunger in the U.S. and around the world. The racial wealth gap simulation was created to educate faith communities, organizations, institutions, and individuals. When it comes to poverty, many people wonder, how did we get here? And why is poverty still occurring in our nation? As a church, we can help feed people who are hungry, and we can meet some of the needs of people living in poverty. And that's very important work. But we can't end hunger without ending poverty. And we can't end poverty without addressing the racial wealth gap. This is why I'm here today, to encourage you to come experience the disparities and be inspired to be a part of the solution and to help us plan ways that we as individuals and as the Market Square community can advocate for policies that will reduce poverty and advance equity among all human beings. 
There's one more important piece of information I want to share with you. The simulation will take up the bulk of the adult form time on April 30th, leaving with us with just a short amount of time for discussion. That is why we have reserved a follow-up session on May the 7th. On that day, we will recap the simulation and delve deeper into the policies. This session will also highlight some of the recommendations of Matthew Desmond, author of Poverty by America, for becoming poverty abolitionists. And we hope to focus on some of the anti-poverty initiatives here in Pennsylvania as well. We hope that many of you who participate on the 30th will return for the session on May 7th to share your experience of participating in the simulation. But we encourage all of you, including those of you who are not able to come next week, to come on May the 7th to help us begin the important work of advocating for our neighbors whose lives are impacted by poverty and racial injustice. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I'll just add that the time that we'll begin for that is 9.15, a little earlier than it used to be um, to accommodate for room for the inner way. Uh, so I hope you can be there at 9.15. At this time, I invite you to stand in body and in spirit for our call to worship. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Beloveds, everything that God has made and is making is good, even us. And so we must confess that we make choices which obscure the goodness of God in us and which make it harder for us to see the goodness of God in our neighbors. So let us confess together. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the work of healing and caring for our planet and all life. Make us agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloveds, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we have been shown the goodness, the full goodness of humanity, God incarnate among us, choosing to be united with us in baptism, offering us forgiveness and freeing us for living as God's own chosen holy people. Let us rejoice in that good news and draw courage and strength for living in the world. Amen. Because we are reconciled to God, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we are called as members of a single body. The peace of the risen Christ be with you. And also with you. Greetings to all of you who are joining us for worship this morning via the radio waves. Uh, we are grateful that you are taking this time and carving this time out for yourself for a moment of worship and reflection 
on God's peace in the world. Um, this Sunday is especially for Earth Care, and so we celebrate uh, Earth Day and especially Earth Sunday. We'll now continue with our children's sermon. As we finish passing the peace, I invite all of the children forward. Come on up here. Good morning. How are you this morning? Here comes. Good morning. How are you? I know. Nice shoes. Bright shoes. I like them. We are continuing in the Easter season. Did you know that Easter was not just one day? It's a whole season. It's eight weeks long. And I know in Sunday school, you all are continuing to hear stories about Jesus appearing to people after he was raised from the dead. And you're going to hear just such a story today. It's called, it's, we commonly call it, um, <laughs> we commonly call it the road to Emmaus story. Thank you. I was trying to think how we commonly call it, but it's so common I forgot. Anyway, the road to Emmaus. You're going to hear that. So Emmaus was a place, and this is a story about two disciples going to um, Emmaus, and they encounter a stranger on the way. And that stranger helps them understand things anew, and they do eventually recognize that stranger. I think you can probably guess, but I'm not going to spoil. <laughs> you can guess. Yes, they eventually recognize that this stranger is Jesus, but it's, it's kind of a mystery. It's like, why didn't they recognize him at first? And so the story helps us understand the different ways that Jesus helps us see new things and understand new things with our hearts and minds. So I think you're going to enjoy that story and thinking about it today downstairs. And I'm glad I didn't have to leave you with a cliffhanger. You already knew. So let's pray before you head down there. Thank you, God, for all of the ways that you speak to us and for uh, people encountering the risen Christ. And we know that happens today too. So help us to have eyes and hearts that enable us to see him always. And I pray for our children who will learn more about that today and us also as we continue to learn and grow in faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening so nicely.
In preparation for hearing God's word, let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that, hearing, we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth, that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God and saw, saw that it was good, and, and there, there was, was evening, evening, and there, there was, was morning, morning the, the third, third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And so it was, God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every wing bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, 
according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. I have, for a long time now, lamented the modern conversation about this passage from Genesis that we've been reading throughout our service today. Our advancements in science have revealed more than humanity has ever known before about the origins of our world and the universe. And in the wake of these exciting and fascinating discoveries, this scripture has either been used for purposes for which it was never intended or dismissed and thrown out altogether. As this creation story does not fit the scientific discoveries on our origins, some have reacted to this by clinging to it in fear and insisting that in fact it is a description of how human beings and our world came to be. Others have embraced modern science and the discoveries about our origins and have dismissed this scripture as no longer relevant for understanding the human experience. And still others have taken sort of a middle route uh, and worked to find parallels between what this scripture tells us and what science tells us, acknowledging, of course, that it's not precisely accurate. I think, in truth, that that last one misses some of the point and the artistry of this passage. Our, our world here our arguments going on about this passage are like arguing that a Beethoven symphony either does or does not teach us something about thermodynamics. This passage was not meant to teach us about astrophysics any more than Beethoven meant to teach us about thermodynamics. But while the cosmology it describes doesn't reflect the scientific study, it is a work of art. It's a work of liturgy. And it is valuable in its own right for the spiritual wisdom it offers and for that invitation into our relationship with God and our relationship with creation. That question of where do human beings fit in the grand order of all that is. In fact, if you read this passage truly, literally, you will notice that God does not create out of nothing. The primordial waters are already there, and God is at work separating, separating waters, revealing dry land, creating space for life to emerge. Each day of creation builds upon the last, further creating that space. 
And yet, each aspect of creation is also pronounced good in and of itself. You have affirmed that throughout worship today with that repeated refrain, and God saw that it was good. And so although each day of creation, God creates something that is necessary for human and animal life to exist, every aspect, the light and the darkness, the dome of sky, the waters above and below the dome, the sun, moon, and stars, the dry land, and all the vegetation are good and valued by God for its own sake, even without human beings to appreciate them and write poems and songs about them. And this tells us that God has a loving, caring relationship with the natural world before human beings ever existed. When human beings are created, God invites us into that relationship. In fact, human value is also exalted in this creation story. We are made in the image of God. And the text is specific that that image is inclusive though the original writers do not have an expansive view of gender and gender expression as we do now. Their intent to show that the image of God is not singular is clear. And so no matter what your gender identity or expression, by virtue of the fact that you are who you are and you are here, you can be sure that you too are made in that image of God vast and diverse as it is. As human beings made in the image of God, we bear particular responsibility in our relationship to God's creation. Now the words used to describe that responsibility have always rubbed me the wrong way. I spent a significant amount of time this week researching the Hebrew words behind the words dominion and subdue, which appear in nearly every English translation of this passage. To be honest, I have more reading to do, because despite all the work I did, I do not yet have clarity about the nuance in those Hebrew words. But I can tell you that there is a multifaceted scholarly discussion And like most Hebrew words, there are still questions about the cultural understanding of those words when they were written. And in fact, even in English, there is nuance in our understanding of those words. The reason they have rubbed me the wrong way and may have done the same for you in the past is because when I think of dominion, I'm reminded of the word dominate. And it makes me think of empires and tyrants and oppression. And when I hear subdue, I imagine a powerful ruler using force to put down civil unrest or oppress their population. I am clearly not the only one to understand these words in that way. I have that understanding because it is part of the culture that I live in. And I fear that our understanding of those terms has horribly distorted our relationship with the natural world and our relationship to God. But the word dominion is also related to the word domicile, meaning home or dwelling place. And earlier this week, I told somebody that Teddy had been more subdued that afternoon, meaning he was calm, he was playing peacefully, he was a little quiet for him. And I started to imagine a relationship very different from that image of a powerful ruler using force to keep people in line. Instead, 
The image that came to my mind was of Miss Marianne, who is a lovely librarian, who until her retirement had led the Born to Read program at the East Shore Area Library and possibly the other branches as well, I'm not sure. The program engages the very youngest library goers in developing an early love of reading. Now I've seen many people try to wrangle and teach a room full of toddlers and babies, and I've even tried it myself. And often it's a bit chaotic. I would say I've had mixed success with trying to do this, but as somebody who struggled, I recognize when there is somebody who really, truly excels at that work. Miss Marianne had an amazing, gentle way of engaging these young ones. They sat or stood and walked around, but yet enraptured as, she, as they listened to Miss Marianne speak. And instead of the atmosphere being stressful and confusing, it was calm despite their wiggles, there was room and space for the children to listen, to learn, and to grow. You probably wouldn't say that Miss Marianne had dominion over these toddlers, and yet there was no doubt who was in charge in that room. She was leading them and guiding them. And she was certainly keeping them subdued as well, but she did this not with force, but by taking many years to gain a deep understanding of these little ones, of their needs and of their ways. And I watched her continue to do that work each day we were there with each individual child, adapting to the kiddos that were in the room on any given day. In other words, she exercised dominion by creating a space most conducive to learning and growth for those kids. And she kept them subdued by seeking to understand and be in relationship with them. And she did all this not exclusively for her own sake, although I'm sure it made it much more enjoyable for her as well, but primarily because she deeply valued these children. Throughout our passage in Genesis, God exercises dominion over creation. But God's example is far more like that image of Miss Marianne than the powerful conquering emperor king that I started with imagining. God is at work creating space for life to emerge. It's the work of nurturing, tending, and delighting in all that is good in creation. And when human beings may, are made in the image of God, we are made as part of that creation, linked to it, connected to it by our very existence. And we are also invited to be co-creators with God, continuing that work of making space for life to thrive and flourish. Human life, animal life, and even plant life, forms of life we don't even fully understand or can't easily categorize. For far, far too long, this passage, and especially those words dominion and subdue, have been used to justify human abuse and exploitation of our natural world and it has led to the suffering of the natural world, of animals and of human beings, especially those who lack wealth and power and are least responsible for the damage we've caused. We confessed to this together already this morning. And yet the amazing grace of God means that despite our failings, God continues to invite us into relationship. And that means we are still called to participate in the work of caring for one another and for the natural world. Of course, 
It is so easy to become overwhelmed and despairing when it comes to the task of doing better. I have thought all too often in my, in my life that the little amount that I can do is hardly enough to make even a smidge of difference in all that we do. We are caught up in systems that contribute to the destruction of this beautiful creation. And it's hard enough to make changes in our own lives, let alone to convince others that those changes are worth making. And so, I wonder if today we can begin to see Genesis 1 as a model for responding to that call in such times as these. We take it one day at a time. We cultivate relationship and understanding with the natural world and with each other. And we keep asking that question, how can I start creating space for life to emerge? Perhaps it might mean simply consuming less, getting creative, avoiding those single-use plastics, limiting our carbon emissions. There are a million and one actions that each one of us can take. In Adult Forum this morning, we learned a little more about creating space for conversation, learning, and challenging the people who are also caught up in these same systems that we are, that are damaging to our world. We won't be perfect at it, but God continues to invite us in. And so today, my challenge for each one of you is to prayerfully consider just one change, one change that you could make or one action you could take to care for the earth. Know that whatever it is you choose to do, even if it is a small thing, even if it is just a beginning, you do not do it alone, but together with God, our creator, together with all of the many human beings across this world. And in God, all things are possible. Would you pray with me? Loving creator, stir our hearts and open our minds to discern what action we might take in the coming days and weeks to respond to your call to be good stewards of creation. Give us the trust that each action will have ripple effects and with the power of your Holy Spirit we'll be able to accomplish far more than we could ever ask or imagine. Amen.
friends, would you join me in affirming our faith using words adapted from the Earth Care Pledge that all uh, Earth Care congregations, including Market Square, take. We believe that peace and justice is God's plan for all creation. The earth and all creation are God's. God calls us to be careful, humble stewards of this earth and to protect and restore it for its own sake and for the future use and enjoyment of the human family. As God offers all people the special gift of peace through Jesus Christ and through Christ reconciles all to God, we are called to deal justly with one another and the earth. With God's help, we seek to live into this call and seek in word and deed to be good stewards of God's creation. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join together in prayer. Good and gracious God, in this Easter season, we pray for eyes to see all the places that you tend with your gracious love and abundant care. Turn our eyes and hearts in that same direction so that we may join in praying and working for resurrection life in accordance with your will. On this weekend of remembering and honoring how precious is the gift of the earth and the glory of all creation, instill in us anew a desire and a commitment to live as stewards of creation. We gather to praise you for the goodness of creation and to marvel at its breadth and beauty and bounty. Observing the depths of the ocean and the brilliance of the stars, open us to new ways of understanding our place in creation. Give us humility so that we may see we are not the center, but we are one integral, integral part among all integral parts in a balanced whole. May every step we take become a prayer so that we may walk lightly on the earth, seeing it as the sustaining gift you intend and not a place to exploit. Awaken people everywhere, awaken your church and especially all who profess to worship you to the need for us to live in cooperation and care with you for creation. Enable us as individuals to make specific commitments in our lives so that we may work together toward creating space for life. Enable us as a body to join our voices advocating for policies that protect. Even as we pray for the earth, we lift to you all those places around the globe in our world where greed and corruption fuel the machines and mechanisms of war, trashing the earth, dividing nation from nation and people from people. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, and we also lift to you the people of Sudan, torn apart again by civil war. Change hearts and minds of leaders everywhere so that they seek peace and not power. For all those who fled Sudan in past civil wars and now reside in other countries, we ask your peace as the trauma of past events is relived and as anxiety for loved ones in their home country rises. We pray too for all of those who are nearer to us, for those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. We lift to you in this moment of silence those whom we hold dear. Bring healing and wholeness to Tom through surgery on Tuesday. Bless Jean on her birthday. Bring comfort to Margie and the families of Tommy and Nancy. Bring comfort to Georgia and Ed, mourning the death of Georgia's brother, Steve. Bring safety and new community to Denny and Sue. Continue to work in the lives of all of those who wait on healing. Especially we remember today Doris and Fran, Patty, Cheryl, Carol, Nancy, Richard, Mike, 
Bart, Susan, Karen, and Mary. For all of these whom we have named aloud and in our hearts and to those known only to you, we ask for sure and certain assurance of your presence in their lives. Receive these prayers, O God, and transform us through them that we may have eyes to see and hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but what you call us to do so that your realm will come to fruition in glory. We pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we pray together as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloveds, God's gifts to us are bountiful. We return but a portion of them. So let us do so with glad and generous hearts.
Almighty God, by your grace, accept the fruit of our labor and the offering of our lives. Let us be a sacrifice of thanksgiving in union with our risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever. Amen. And now, friends, in God's peace, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord's countenance be lifted up and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.